hello, hello world, hello internet, hello Jason Isaac, hello devotees of the church. Judicial review, yeah, I know I've done it before. Um, I've done it many times. I've even tried doing this presentation many, many times, uh, but it is still causing uh, some confusion, not least to myself. This is the fifth time uh, I've done this recording. Uh, I've got a good feeling about it this time. It's going to get through. We're going to get through onto the other side. I'll be able to get this uploaded and get on with the rest of the things I've got to do today. So judicial review, why is it so confusing? And I think it's really confusing because people aren't grasping uh, what judicial review is and what its relationship with judicial activism and judicial restraint is. Now, at its most basic, basic question, at its most basic level, excuse me, judicial review is the asking of the question. We ask the question, is this, whatever it is, is it constitutional? And the answer to that question will either demonstrate activism or it will demonstrate restraint. If the answer to the question, is this constitutional? No. If the answer to that question is no, then what we're looking at is judicial activism. If the answer to that question is yes or kind of or just about enough, then we are saying or we are demonstrating, sorry, or what is evident is judicial restraint. So judicial review is the asking of the question and the answer to that question will demonstrate either activism or restraint. Now, hopefully that's going to clear up uh, the difference between judicial review and judicial activism and judicial restraint. They're obviously related, but they're very, very different things. And they are controversial uh, for very, very different reasons. So let's look at them one at a time. I start off with judicial review. So what is judicial review? Well, it's this. The assessment of any action uh, by the state or any legislation, both state and federal, uh, on constitutional grounds. So we're looking at something, an executive order, um, a law, and we're saying, is this constitutional? Does this fit through the constitutional gaps? Now, what I really want to address here, and I think perhaps this is a consequence of some of my earlier work, and my theory, my thinking on this is clarifying all the time, and I, hopefully this is going to show you the way out of the bottle, uh, even if I pushed you in there in the first place. Judicial review may or may not be anti-federal, okay? It is not necessarily anti-federal. Yes, we can look at some cases where we see the federal court imposing a one-size-fits-all policy. We could look at Gonzalez reich in 2005. We could look at DC versus Heller in 2008. So yes, there are those occasions when the nine people in Washington will impose a one-size-fits-all policy across the entirety of the United States. But not always. We've got, on the other hand, Bowers versus Hardwick in 86, where we upheld the right of the citizens to be, uh, so the right of the states to be profoundly homophobic. Uh, we can look at Shelby County versus uh, Holder, where we, where the state, sorry, the, uh, the federal court, the Supreme Court even, upheld the right of the states to uh, pass laws that were restrictive to, uh, oh God, I couldn't have explained that any better. They struck down the Voting Rights Act or something. Um, so it allowed states to impose their own laws regarding voter registration, which obviously worked tremendously uh, in favor of the Republican Party. And of course, we've got US versus Windsor, where the Defense of Marriage Act was struck down because there's nothing in the Constitution about marriage. And so that really is the job of the states. So it's not necessarily anti-federal. There may be anti-federal legislation, but it's not necessarily uh, anti-federal. At the same time, it's not necessarily anti-democratic. Yes, it might occasionally strike down laws that emanate from our elected rep our elected institutions. But at the same time, we've got McConnell versus FEC that upheld the legislation. And of course, we've got Sibelius in 2012, where the federal, where the Supreme Court upheld uh, Obamacare. So if it's not necessarily anti-federal and it's not necessarily anti-democratic, what is judicial review? What must judicial review be? Well, it must, by definition, be extra constitutional. There is nothing in the Constitution about judicial review. It was instead established through precedent and that precedent being Marbury versus Madison. Now, that in and of itself is significant. OK, uh, it, make it makes the constitutionality of judicial review itself uh, somewhat dubious. But it's not really that interesting in and of itself. What is really interesting about the fact that judicial review is extra constitutional is that because it's not in the Constitution, it is thereby outside the system of checks and balances. It is a check uh, without a balance. And this, of course, is how we wind up with our, um, with our uh, uh, imperial judiciary. And my 
So we have an imperial judiciary, that is, we have an unaccountable and uh, judiciary that just does whatever the hell uh, it likes. So we have a judicial, uh, uh, excuse me, we have an imperial judiciary because it is operating outside the system of checks and balances. And if you're on the wrong side uh, of a judicial decision, uh, then this is put into very stark relief, a very sharp relief. Uh, by that, uh, by this, uh, by this conundrum, what can you do then if you are on the wrong side of a judicial decision? Well, not very much. You've got three options principally. One is to legislate through the gaps, which is of course what happens with abortion. Uh, the second is to amend the constitution, and we all know how easy that is. Uh, the last time the constitution was amended uh, in the face of a constitutional, in the face of a judicial decision, uh, was 1913, when we had the 16th Amendment being passed uh, in response to Pollock. Uh, of 1865 or was it 1895? May have that date wrong. Uh, I will double check. Um, our, you, alternatively, you can wait for SCOTUS to shift, and we know that because we all know about the. Uh, and uh, there's another typo. It's the Bi BCRA, the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Act. Um, so you can wait for the balance of SCOTUS to shift and then try your case again. But basically, you have got three options, and neither of them are particularly good because the Supreme Court is operating as a check without a balance. So it may be that it's anti-federal, it may be that it is anti-democratic, but it is necessarily extra-constitutional, and because it is necessarily extra-constitutional, it is necessarily a check without a balance. I hope that's clear. I wouldn't be focusing really on this because it's just confusing. What I would focus on here is this particular aspect here, but it is necessarily extra-constitutional, necessarily uh, a check without a balance, and that shoves the court towards imperial judiciary status. Okay, so much for judicial act, judicial review, the asking of the question. Now let's look at the nature of the answer. What is judicial activism and why is that controversial? Well, judicial activism is this, the striking down of any action by the state uh, of uh, the striking down, sorry, of any action by the state or any legislation against state or federal on the grounds of being unconstitutional, or the reversing of judicial precedent. Now, everybody is, knows about this. Everyone's very happy with this bit. This is the bit that tends not to be looked at so much. And I think that given we're looking to build a, uh, an argument of a couple of parts, it's really important that we address these two ideas independently. And it also raises a very significant point of contrast, because if we're striking down state action, if we're striking down legislation or state action, that raises the question of whether or not it's political. Now, look, I know most of the fruity questions we look at are going to have a political element in them. That goes without saying. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that all cases that the Supreme Court looks at are decided on political grounds. And the easiest way of demonstrating that is to look at something like Judah Lang versus Holder. Now, this isn't a very interesting case in particular. It's to do with extradition. They wanted to extradite Mr. Judah Lang to the Philippines, but they couldn't. And the significant point here is that the judgment in this particular decision was 9-0. And it was one of 20, at least 20 decisions that went 9-0 against Obama. Now, if you're on the wrong side of a 9-0 uh, decision, then that really cannot be a political decision. That must be a technical decision. Now, most of these technical problems will get weeded out by the junior courts. But every now and again, in, in Obama's case 20 times, you have uh, a case going through that is decided purely on technical grounds, because here we've got Sotomayor and Kagan and all the other liberals voting against Obama, striking down his uh, attempts, not his personally, but his government's attempts to deport Mr. Judah Lang. And uh, I link off at the back of this to uh, a an article uh, written largely by Ted Cruz, actually, which is a name I remember for some reason. I'm sure he was significant at some point. Um, anyway, Ted Cruz did some research and he found that 20 decisions, uh, had at least 20 decisions, had gone 9-0 uh, against Obama. And if, again, if something's going 9-0, then that's technical. It's not, um, it's not, um, political. Now, again, most of the, most of the, uh, cases that we look at are, have a political element. But it doesn't necessarily mean that every single one of them does. Just bear that in mind, and particularly because of where we're going to go later when we look at contrasting that with precedent. So it may or may not be political. Uh, is it anti-democratic? Well, yes, it is. If you're striking down the actions of elected representatives, if unelected judges are striking down the actions of uh, elected representatives, then by definition, that is anti-democratic. End of. You pick any of your 
any of your particular things there, uh, even that Jude Lang. So Jude Lang here, we've got uh, elected government trying to deport somebody. The Supreme Court turns around and says, no, you can't do that. We've got unelected judges striking down uh, elected decision, uh, the, the decisions of elected officials. Uh, it's anti-democratic. Yeah, it is. But on this occasion, those democratic people got it wrong. And so it is right of the court to stand up and tell them that they did uh, get it wrong. Okay, so it may or may not be political. It is always anti-democratic when we're striking down legislation. Well, what about precedent? Well, if we're reversing precedent, is that political? And the answer to that is it must be, it has to be. Unless the Constitution has changed, and we know that the Constitution doesn't change very often, then reversing precedent must be a political decision. And here are all our cases that do that. You should know what all of those are. We have a decision by one court that is then reversed by another court. The court changes its mind. Now, whether it's between 1989, 2005, or whether it happens in 2003, 2008, 2010, 2016, sorry, 2014, doesn't matter. What the, what's important here is that the court is changing its mind. And if you are reversing uh, precedent, then you're taking a political decision. And this means that what we're looking at here is not an imperial judiciary, but rather the legislators of last resort. And my pen isn't working again. Um, definitely not working. So legislators of last resort or indeed uh, politicians in robes. And that is a different question, a different problem from what we were looking at earlier. It's related to the imperial judiciary um, and it has significant links to the uh, imperial, ju imperial judiciary. But these are legislators of last resort. And of course, you want your legislators to be accountable, not imperial, because these guys are exercising their judgment rather than making technical decisions of law. And that has profound consequences that echo across the entirety uh, of the Supreme Court. Okay. Um, that's activism. What about restraint? Well, judicial restraint is this, the showing of deference to democratic authority on precedent when making the, when assessing the constitutionality, blah, 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 blah. So that is judicial um, restraint. Um, what is it? So why is it controversial? Well, judicial review is controversial because sometimes egregious positions can hide behind or within the constitution. So we will have an egregious but not unconstitutional position. We can look at separate but equal. Um, or indeed, we can look at discrimination against minorities. Bowers Hardwick, I'm thinking of you here. Now, in both of these positions, in both of these instances, uh, we have uh, positions that are dubious, uh, but they are not unconstitutional. If the Supreme Court does not act and strike those, those positions down, then you could argue that they are not uh, fulfilling um, their proper role. Again, it depends what you see their role as being. If you're a strict, well, there are no strict constructions, but if you're an originalist, then you are going to say, well, this is, this is not uh, the court's problem. You know, if we've got a problem with the constitution, we should change the constitution. But of course, it follows from that, that the problem we have is that the constitution is too hard to amend. So if it's not the courts that are going to strike out and change uh, this thing, then, um, then who is going to, you know, the, who is going to tell Texas that it's wrong to have laws? criminalizing an act uh, between uh, straight people, uh, sorry, criminalizing an act between gay people that is, that is legal, but between, between uh, straight people. So we have here the idea that, uh, that you know, we, we've got problems with substantive due process or the rule of law. Um, however, uh, sorry, the, the flip side to this argument is that if uh, SCOTUS is deferring uh, to democracy when the Constitution has clearly been breached, uh, its independence has evidently uh, been compromised. The independence of the judiciary says the judiciary should be able to exercise without fear or favor. But if it think, keeps thinking, oh, I can't really strike that one down because it was created by elected officials, then we have a problem. And I think we can see this again if we look at Bowers Hardwick. When I put this together, then we have that idea that uh, evidence was required. But in Bowers versus Hardwick, the court looked at this issue. It looked at uh, the laws uh, about gay sex. And it said that we had uh, we, we have this or we have this situation whereby one type of sex between one couple is legal, but the same type of sex between a different couple is illegal. Now that is a contravention of the rule of law. You're criminalizing the person rather than the act. But the Supreme Court ducked that issue. They said, no, actually, we're not going to go down that road. Um, we're going to defer to elected representatives. And uh, that is, I think, undermining the independence of the judiciary. So those are two reasons 
why the uh, why judicial review is controversial. Uh, you can hide egregious positions within the Constitution, uh, and the Constitution is too hard to amend. And finally, you can undermine judicial independence. Right, I am very, very nearly out of time. Uh, here are the resources. The uh, That's it. Bye.